Mae'n anrhydedd mawr bod yma ac mae'n gyfrifol dem mawr. I feel a heavy weight of responsibility on my shoulders uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's such an important topic and I hope to be able to convey the importance of it to you today uh, in my near dotage. So uh, I hope I, I, I don't, uh, cloffy is the word, come right, for, trip over my words too often. I'd like to start with two simple points. First of all, it's a topic which is replete with lies, misinformation, greenwash, and self-deception. And I want to say to you, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a climatologist. I'm not an atmospheric physics. I'm not a modeler. I was a biochemist, come biologist. And my work was on the way plants adapt to stresses, salt, drought, and to an extent, temperature. That's then led to an interest in work abroad and through the Center of Arid Zone Studies, which the Vice Chancellor referred to, I became aware many years ago that climate change was a reality and was affecting people's lives and society and had the capacity to undermine those societies and in fact, the global culture in general. So that's where I come from. And the second thing I want to say, because much of what I'm going to say is quite depressing, is that I'm trying to walk a very narrow path between hope and despair in this lecture and in this topic. And I hope that uh, we realize that we're facing an extraordinary situation, an extraordinarily serious situation, in all likelihood being made worse by the awful war that is now going on in Ukraine and what and the Russian attacks on those people. So as I say in the blurb, it said, the truth shall make us free. I hope so, but that truth is pretty unpalatable and the actions that are required are a challenge, not just technologically or environmentally, but I contend to the very basis of our society and to us as, as individuals. This is that personal element, our aspirations, our hopes, our despairs, that will be, I think, the nub of this lecture in the end. Unfortunately, we need to temper, not, not unfortunate, we need to temper that despair with hope. And one of the most important things that we have facing mankind in the end is trying to imagine a better way. Imagine a new society which respects both people and the environment. And I hope that we get to that at the end. But let me start with a brief review of what's actually happened in COP26 and subsequent events. As we all know, the horrors of the Russian invasion have actually all but eradicated COP26 from the news agenda and from our memories. Few of us can still recall those first two heady weeks in November last year, when climate change was the top of the local and of the international news agenda. It's disappeared and it's only six months ago. We were told at COP26 that this was humanity's last chance, maybe last best chance, but maybe last chance to avoid catastrophic change. All agreed at that time that we humans are facing one of our greatest challenges and one that is capable of undermining our prosperity and the prosperity of future generations. Clearly, the topic was of deep concern to the United Nations in all aspects, from the Menai branch right through to New York. The crucial issue all agreed, everybody knows this, was how to wean our globalized civilization built for almost 200 years on fossil fuel energy, on coal 
oil and gas off those fossil fuels in short order. And short order will be a major point of this talk as the carbon dioxide released by burning these fuels together with the other greenhouse gases, such as methane, which are released as well, not only would cause damaging global warming, but actually would make parts of this planet uninhabitable within half a century. At COP21 in Paris in 2015, 197 nations agreed to a voluntary target of keeping the increase in mean global atmospheric temperature to, as was said, well below two degrees, if possible, 1.5 degrees centigrade. This ambition was reaffirmed in Glasgow last November, six years later, despite the mean rise now being between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees centigrade, and in reality, six more years of inaction. Not only inaction, but in the case of Trump's America and Putin's Russia and other places, as other people, not just inactivity, but deliberate subversion and denial. So the problem is increasingly serious. Despite this at Glasgow, we were assured that the objective of limiting average global atmospheric temperature increases to 1.5 degrees was still alive. And it was agreed that deep cuts were needed in the next uh, eight to 10 years. It was also agreed, I think significantly, that there should be a phasing out of coal which is the most polluting of, as you know, the fossil fuels and the reduction in the enormous subsidies which are given to the fossil fuel industry, estimated by the United Nations itself as about $420 billion a year subsidy for the fuels that are damaging us. At Glasgow, President Biden of the US promised a vast green deal of about $2 trillion to achieve a rapid rollout of greener, low carbon energy in the United States. Quite excitingly, China and the UN even agreed to collaborate to cut methane emissions from fracking and related activities. And as new technologies are coming on stream to pinpoint such leaks, this sounded very promising. As methane, of course, as you all know, is a much more damaging greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the rich countries agreed again, finally, to make good their promise made in Paris to transfer 100 billion pounds a year from the rich to the poorer countries to fund low carbon technologies and to allow them to avoid the disastrous fossil fuel driven economic path that we followed over these years. And crucially, it appeared six months ago that the climate change deniers had at last been vanquished. Global warming and fossil fuel burning and land use changes, especially deforestation were universally acknowledged as being harbingers of a looming disaster. It seems to me that one of the elements that brought this about was all the global disasters that occurred last year. There were the floods and fires and the temperatures that occurred last year all over the world. And as a prelude to Glasgow, it concentrated mines substantially. It was agreed that there were problems and it would take a decade or two to wean China and India off coal, but it was agreed that that was the direction of travel. And of course, we had the spectacle of our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the great boost to himself, trumpeting that you, you, the United Kingdom would have a le world leading role. You've heard that word quite often, I think, a world leading role. According to which the United Kingdom 
would lead humanity to a new Eden of new zero carbon prosperity. Mark the word net zero, net zero carbon prosperity. We will return to net zero and what it means later on. The question I put to you, did you believe them then? And do you believe them now? Is that the truth of the situation? You will recall that Greta Thunberg at the end of Glasgow said it was all blah, blah, blah. And immediately after Glasgow, the doubts started to emerge. The NGOs and a number of academics based on the International Panel for Climate Change, IPCC documentation, calculated that if you actually added together all the promises from all the countries that represented in Glasgow, it wouldn't represent 1.5 or 2, but at least 2.5 degree increase in the main global temperature. But net zero was the watchword, possibly the catchword. Promises were made by governments, including our own, to reach this magical net zero by 2040 or 2050. Some a little later, such as India and China, but there's little indication of what net zero actually means. And so things were left to the next COPs. And so you'll be pleased to know that COP27 is being organized in, in all places, Sharm El Sheikh, the desert resort in Egypt, which is almost inaccessible other than by air. And I understand that in Sharm El Sheikh, the hotel rooms are advertised at $700 a night. So the NGOs are going to be pressed, A, to get there, and B, to live there when they're there. And COP28 is now being prepared as well. And you know where that will be? In the United Arab Emirates. So there's a long, long way to go. And by the way, COP stands for the uh, party, the Conference of the Parties, not in the party gate sense, but the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on climate change. Now, what I found disconcerting is even before the disastrous invasion of Ukraine by Russia and its tragic consequences, things have gone very, very quiet post COP26. Climate change has certainly receded from the agenda in Westminster, faced with a fiasco of party gates, the trials on Micron, uh, rising fossil fuel prices and the effects of Brexit. When did you last hear a senior politician in London mention the urgency of responding to climate change and cutting emissions? Indicative of this situation, I don't know, you will know of it, sir. Uh, the Good Law Project is actually taking the UK government to court because they haven't published a plan to achieve net zero by 2040, even though in their own laws, they are required to do so. So there's a legal case against the government for not fulfilling their own laws in order to uh, cut emissions. Even before Ukraine, the UK government was intent on opening a new oil field in the North Sea, likely a Cumbrian coal mine, and the US, Biden's green initiative has stalled because of one Democratic senator beholden to the coal industry. Sadly, Biden's administration has also given permission for a string of new hydrocarbon explorations. The Republicans, of course, under Trump, are still embracing denial. Australia has been pushing ahead with new coal mines. Poland is resisting the EU curb on emission. China and India are developing coal, and I've had nothing, I'm afraid, of the China-US methane initiative. If I've missed it, I'm delighted to be corrected. 
Let us say a positive word about our government in Wales. Within their limited power, they are showing a real determination to act, supporting the modernized project in Holyhead and reducing spending on roads, even though that's unpopular. So there is a, a determination there. But perhaps more important is there are a lot of local initiatives around us here, which we will return to later, which are the seeds of hope in this calamitous situation. With the calamity of Ukraine gripping everyone now, it's obvious everybody's desperate to find new sources of fossil fuels because of our dependency on particularly countries in Europe on Russian gas and oil. Our prime minister, Boris the booster, went off to sweet talk the autocraft, if not the murderer, Mohammed bin Salam with modest success, but at least they came back with his head. 81 people lost theirs the, the day before. In Westminster now, the emphasis on the need is to start fracking again in the UK, increase our self-sufficiency on fossil fuels, or alternatively to back a massive program of building nuclear power stations. The government in the UK has decided to reopen Abarpergum open cast or to expand it. Uh, so coal is back on the agenda. And the Welsh government had no authority in that area. But more worryingly, in Westminster, the Brexiteers have initiated the so called Net Zero Scrutiny Group, together with the denialists of Nigel Lawson's Global Warming Research Foundation. So, under a new guise, denial is back on the agenda. And our friend Nigel Farage is back at it again, calling for a referendum on the net zero carbon target in the name of protecting UK living standards. So denial never disappeared in the US and is back under a new form. So that's a bleak situation that we face. So I'd like to show you a few slides, first of all, to indicate the history of our inaction. This is a very well-known graph, the so-called Keeling curve of the accumulation of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere from 1958, measured on the top of a mountain in Hawaii. You've all seen this graph before, and despite the annual variation, it's actually accelerating. There's absolutely no evidence at all that the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which itself then is responsible for uh, the greenhouse gas effect and global warming primarily, I'm afraid I must apologize, there's no time to talk about the other greenhouse gases. I'm just concentrating on carbon dioxide. So that is the graph and no evidence that anything has changed. <laughs> this is the same graph inserted on it are a number of important events, the blah, blah, blah of Greta Thunberg. I had a, a couple of, uh, down here when I was young, 1965 was the first major report on climate change to Lyndon Bain Johnson, the premier, the sort of the, the, the uh, uh, God, uh, of the United States. And uh, the first, conference was in 1979, and the first IPCC report chaired by Sir John Houghton, a local man that we should be extremely proud of at that time. And there have been a series up to here, and a lot of talk and no action. At the bottom, a representation of the changes in temperature over that time, but more accurately presented in this way, from the very early industrial period and the, the individual histograms are a tenth of a degree with the cooler ones represented in deep blue and the warmer ones in red, all against the mean between 1970 and 2000. This is taken as the mean. 
So you, the trend is entirely clear. The trend in carbon dioxide is entirely clear. And this is the challenge that we face. Since carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere, as you all know, what we do now, what we have done, and what we will do are important to the future of this world for decades, indeed for centuries. So we're faced with an issue which is anticipatory. We have to anticipate and work now for the good of the future. The other thing to point out is that the carbon dioxide from all sources equilibrates. Again, I'm sure you know this. So our emissions and those from China or Chad or Russia or Australia equilibrates in the atmosphere into a common pool, which extends over time back to the early days of the Industrial Revolution and forward into the future. This is the challenge that we face. The other important components of this is that individual concentration, individual contributions vary extremely widely from country to country and from person to person. And before going on, I want to note in for accuracy in one important point that although we talk about the atmospheric temperatures, 90% of the heat which is absorbed due to the greenhouse effect are actually absorbed in the oceans. The heat capacity of the air is very low. The, the, the heat goes into the oceans and that will have a long-term effect. And unfortunately, there are plenty of people in Bangor who could talk about it with great authority, but uh, there's no time to talk about it today. So that's, this is our collective failure, unfortunately. So the question is, given this background, where are we in relation to the aspirations of 1.5 degrees and the targets of two degrees? So this is taken from the IPCC, highly simplified. And I'm sorry to show you numbers. People don't like being shown numbers in general. So I do apologize, but I do need to show you a few numbers. So this is an estimate of the remaining carbon budget from January 2020, compatible with either 1.5 or two degrees. And let's just assume that we're responsible people and want an odds on chance of not exceeding these targets. So we see 83% chance of not exceeding 1.5 degrees. We have 300 units. Forget what the, what the units are. It doesn't matter. 300 units left. And to not exceed 2 degrees, 900 units. Since this is actually backdated to January, and we are emitting 40 units per year globally, it means we've already used 80 of those up and 80 of these up. So we have about three, 220 gigatons units of emissions left to us and we're emitting at the rate of 40 a year. So if you do your four times table, it's between five and six years and we will have emitted all the carbon dioxide that we can afford to meet that target. That is pretty dismal. If you then say, well, we'll take a bigger risk in a 50-50, we still have only 500 and we've used 40 of those, so it's down to 420. So it's still only 10 years. So the, the points, the crucial point from the IPC data is that we're running out of time. Even if you go to the two degree target and the emissions are being maintaining their, their current rates, we're going to find that we will be running out of time. The problem with, with these numbers is that once you've used them all up, there's nothing left. And this is illustrated very well in the next slide. This is a very dramatic slide. These are the carbon dioxide emissions on this axis. 
this is time on this axis, and the emissions here are uh, set at about 37 units of carbon dioxide a year. That equivalent is the amount which is released from fossil fuel burning. The 40 on the other slide includes emissions from land use changes. So this is, the, this is a lower, but, but the longer we leave it, the sharper the cuts have to be, and the less emissions are left for future generations. This becomes extremely important when you consider that at this point in time, that's about 2050, the global population will be approaching 10 billion and feeding ourselves currently is responsible for about 30% of total emissions. So at this point in time, the emissions that we have left over are one or two tons, nothing. So we're using the rations which are due to our children, to our children's children. And on top of that, there are many industrial processes, cement manufacture, steel manufacture, which currently are highly carbon intensive. So the situation is pretty dire. So even if you assume a two degree target, we have to approach the next 10 years as an emergency and make extremely serious cuts. I'd like to use an odd unit to illustrate to you how great this challenge is. If you think of the, the Hinkley C nuclear power station, and in this I'm not advocating nuclear power, I'm just using it as an example. The power station was first talked about in 2008. Permission was granted to start building in 2016, and it may come on stream in 2026. So that one unit of generation has taken over 20 years to come to permission. If we see the capacity of that unit, the capacity of Hinkley C is 3.2 gigawatts, and it can generate a certain number, I'm sorry to give you numbers, 20 to 25 terawatts of electricity per year. Right, so let's compare that with the UK demand. The current UK demand for electricity is 330 of these terawatt units. So they will produce 20. But if we are to electrify and decarbonize our economy, the amount of electricity we're going to use is to increase probably threefold. So we're talking about a demand of about a thousand to which Henkley, after 20 years of gestation, will produce about 20. So you need dozens of Henkleys if nuclear power is going to provide it on the scale that's required. It's pretty frightening and it takes a lot of time to do it. The situation in Wales is not much better. Only about 10% of our total energy comes from renewable sources at the moment. And we've got an awful long way to go to produce sufficient um, on the scale required and 10 years to cut our emissions. But the message is entirely clear. The longer we leave it, the steeper the cuts, as in this graph. And the more dangerous the situation becomes. I conclude personally, the world has virtually no chance of achieving the 1.5 degree target, and only a very low chance of, a, of, a, of the two degree target. And the two degree target requires a degree of global cooperation and innovation and political determination, which we have never seen in the history of humanity. Perhaps we can compare it loosely with Kennedy's Man on the Moon project, but it's much, much larger and it covers the whole of the world. And quite frankly, 
I, I fear it is a mirage. I'd also like to point out that it's not realized that 80%, more than 80% of the global energy currently comes from fossil fuel burning. Hence the influence of Putin on one hand and Mohammed bin Salam on the other. And that the rollout of new renewable low carbon energy, much discussed in the media, is actually slower than the increase in demand if you take into account the decline in nuclear power over the last two or three decades. So we're not actually winning. If anything, we're losing the battle. I'd like to just enumerate one or two very quickly of the characteristics of, of this warming. It's closely related to affluence. If you look at the data, it's quite clear it's the rich of us uh, that are uh, producing the emissions. To give you just one set of data, in 2010, the 10% most affluent households, which includes all of us here, emitted about a third of the global CO2 emissions. The 50% of the poorer households in the world produced about 15%. But by 2015, the richer 10% were responsible for half the emissions and the, the poorest half were responsible for only 7%. I don't have more recent data, but my guess is that this trend of inequality has actually continued. And the degree of inequality in terms of per capita emissions is enormous. Qatar in the Gulf, the emissions are about 30 tons of carbon dioxide per person. In many African countries, it's below 0.1, a 300 fold differential between the rich and the poor. So to the first approximation, the richer you are, the higher your carbon dioxide footprint will be. For you Chinese, South African, Welsh, or Russian. It does follow then that the only hope is for the richer people to cut their emissions. If you look at the data, it doesn't actually matter if Africa cut their emissions by 50%. It would make virtually no difference. It's down to us. Even if India reverts to Gandhian type policies, which they're not going to do, and cut their emissions substantially, let's say by a third in two or three years, that would hardly register. It's down to us. The poor will bear the weight of the burden and they will suffer most, but they're, they're least responsible for the situation we're in. Very quickly, production and consumption. If you listen to the spin from our governments in, in the UK, the emphasis always is on the, emission, the production emissions, the emissions from a particular country, from a particular bit of land, not the emissions that are supporting the people that live there. And so as Britain has, to a significant extent, uh, deindustrialized, the production emissions of the UK have been cut substantially. But if you look at the consumption emissions, they have hardly been cut at all. Net zero and carbon capture, very, very quickly again. This is regarded as uh, the, the, the solution by many people. There are a number of ways that that can be achieved. One of them is to capture the atmospheric carbon dioxide either by forestry, or by industrial, physical, chemical, carbon dioxide capture from the atmospheric carbon dioxide, or the capture by a point source from a power station, for instance, or in extremis by global geoengineering schemes, such as fertilizing the oceans. For politicians, it's a convenient way of kicking the can down the road. Saying one thing, promising, net zero by 2040, but taking little action now, and now is important. 
Kevin Anderson, who gave this lecture three years ago or four years ago, has said that he regards it all as a con, very clearly. He is very critical of what's going on. And I sympathize with his position. To give you some Welsh numbers, in Wales, we have emissions of about 35 to 38 megatons, a much smaller unit of carbon dioxide than globally, as you'd imagine. The official policy is to plant 180,000 hectares of forests in Wales. That's Welsh government policy. If you work out after 15 to 20 years, that will create a sink about a tenth of our current emissions. And that's not in the time frame of the required change of the next 10 years. And of course, forestry, if recklessly pursued and a great concern, can compete with food production, which itself is likely to suffer from climate change. So when you hear people talk about net zero, listen very carefully. And when they hear about carbon offsetting, listen equally carefully, because it may be that you are being deceived. The fourth element here that I want to mention is global and local. I've given you the data from the IPCC, which is what the modeling gives us, which is mean atmospheric global temperature. Of course, we don't live globally. We live locally. If you look at the data, then the terrestrial warming is significantly greater than oceanic warming. That is the atmosphere over the land has warmed much more than over the sea. So already the terrestrial warming is about 1.4 degrees, whereas the oceanic warming, the atmosphere is about 0.8 degrees. Also, if you look at the distribution of that warming, through the globe, the warming is much greater near the poles than it is near the equator. So the global warming uh, in the Arctic is already well over three degrees. This is important because of course, it is in the, in the poles that we have the ice caps and that we have also the sea ice, both of which are melting increasingly rapid rates. So we have to consider that the mean is a guidance figure, not more than that. Which brings us also to the other extreme, the high temperatures. I don't know if you follow these things as I do, because I'm obsessed by it. Uh, in the Indian subcontinent, the temperatures are now exceeding 50 degrees and high humidities, which is lethal to humanity. And we used to live in Canada. And last summer, as you probably know, the temperature recorded at Lytton in British Columbia was 49.4 degrees, which to me, having lived in British Columbia, is quite incredible. I cannot believe that that has already happened. And locally also, it's important to remember that water supplies are local and in parts of the world dependent on glaciers, which are themselves are melting very quickly. So which brings us neatly to these tipping points. And there are, and the reason of the 1.5 degree target and the two degree target was in this area, the anticipation is there will be a number of tipping points passed. And I've simply listed them here. The irreversible melting of the Greenland ice cap which will cause uh, sea level rise. And as I'm sure you all know, that there's about six to seven meters of sea level rise embedded in the ice cap of Greenland. A similar irre irreversible melting of the West Antarctic ice, uh, which has another seven meters potential sea level rise within it. And <clears throat> the decline in Amazonia as a carbon sink, which is happening partly because of climate change and partly because of human deforestation. And the melting out of the glaciers, 
should the Himalayan glaciers melt, that is a total disaster for humanity because so many people in India and China depend on these water resources. And of course, we have the coral bleaching. And on top of that, we have the potential oxidation and fermentation of the tundra and the carbon peat stores that exist in Siberia and Northern Canada. If you look at the data, between 1.5 and 2 degrees, it is anticipated all these will trip in. So again, the longer we leave it, the bigger the risk. We have grown rich on this background. And now, as I see it, the chickens are coming home to roost. I regret to say we only heard a faint cluck, cluck, cluck from the chickens in Glasgow. It was in fact, blah, 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 rather than actually uh, a way forward. The crucial question to me is why have we been so irresponsible as human beings? Why have we, for the last at least 30 years, it's been assured, it's been almost certain for 50 to 60 years, and we've sat on our hands. Why? Well, I suppose the, 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 the simple answer is greed, you know, tragically. Um, as the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine has demonstrated dramatically, a plentiful supply of cheap convenience, fossil fuel energy is what drives our societies. And any current economy, Russian, European, American, Chinese, depends on that. And as a result, many, many people make a vast amount of money as a result of this. And so there has been a huge reluctance to actually move away from that system. Also, it has meant that a awful lot of money has been spent convincing us uh, that it is not important. Exxon, the Koch brothers, the Saudis, and many others have actually been paying vast sums of money to slow action and at the meantime to make enormous profits. I saw last week uh, in a thing called Arab News, one company, Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company, made a profit of $110 billion in 2021. And that's before the increase in the price of oil that's occurred recently. So I imagine their profit this year will be approaching half a trillion dollars. So greed undoubtedly has played a part. But I think there's another more significant uh, relationship that we have to uh, consider. And that is our relationship to the economy. Historically, there's been a very close relationship between economic growth and wealth. This is a graph showing that relationship from a couple of years ago. And you can see that there's a, a, a logarithmic relationship between the energy use and the wealth in, of individual countries, as illustrated on that uh, graph. As a consequence, the people that have not, the Indians down here, are determined to follow the same path and feel that they have a right now to insist on their share of emissions uh, that we have tended to monopolize over time. This is reinforced by our economic philosophy. The idea that greed is good. There was a famous film uh, when a man called Gordon Gecko and said, greed is good in that film. And our society is to a significant extent based on that idea that self-interest should be lauded, that we as humans should be portrayed as homo economicus, an agent who is consistently rational, narrow-minded, self-interested, pursuing subjectively defined, usually ex exclusively economic ends. 
optimally. I have serious doubts whether that philosophy is actually compatible with combating global warming, which requires cooperation and from the richer people, a degree of self-sacrifice and self-denial. But that itself poses a difficult question because undoubtedly capitalism has been extremely dynamic. And can the dynamic and creativity of capitalism be harnessed to a greater good? It's not at all clear that that can be achieved. There are many economists who talk about graded and accumulated carbon taxes or tradable and diminishing emissions quotas as ways of making the capitalist system compatible with the demands of climate change. I'm not sure that's going to succeed. I hope it does, but I have doubts. It seems to me that if there's no appreciation of the rights of the low-lying Pacific Islanders by us all, including the stockbroker wolves of Wall Street, of Shanghai and of Canary Wharf, then I see no prospect of the essential effective financial interventions are required. If you think of the UK governments, unfortunately, the purchase of the PPE during the COVID crisis and the way it was handled bodes ill for the sort of cooperation and the force of forethought that is required. The other big problem is that we run a four to five year electoral cycle. And within that cycle, it's not easy to commit the resources that are required to decarbonize the economy, particularly if you're aiming at the, the better off. The consultancy company McKinsey last year published an estimate of the investment required in infrastructure to decarbonize the economy. The sum McKinsey came up with was $9.2 trillion a year. That is an increase of $3.5 trillion a year on the current investments all around the world in that area. That's a huge sum of money. How much precisely can be obviously discussed and undoubtedly will be contested, but it's the sort of money which it's very difficult uh, for us to find. And there are plenty of people out there, Trumps, Johnsons, Farages, where there's seductive and false messaging, messaging. And after all, we're in Britain and we're not in the main firing line. It's those pesky foreigners. And there's also a very strong hints of white supremacist, uh, supremacism in the way we all react. So all these are serious issues. And there is still a serious issue about the low carbon economy. It's not straightforward at all. The renewable resources which we desire are intermittent, seasonal and dispersed. Although they're financially competitive, actually exploiting them is a major problem. And there are plenty of people to complain uh, about any particular initiative. And there is a big infrastructure requirement and also demand for other natural resources, lithium for car batteries, rare earths for electronics and the sort of copper itself. The truth is that there are no energy free meals, politically, economically or environmentally. In this context, the post COP26 comments of Boris Johnson were very revealing. He assumed that free market capitalist model would be unchanged, miraculously energized by low carbon sources with an added unspecified carbon capture to reach net zero by 2040 or even earlier. I regard this as an extremely suspect scenario. And yet it's not just in the UK, the same thinking is replete in America in the Democratic Party and in its own way in China and in India. 
The model stays the same. We don't have to change much. We just go for renewables. On the time scale that I've given you, I think this is highly improbable. But my final and deepest concern is human nature itself, our behavior, our neurophysiology, our reliance on our instinctive automatic responses. Again, this requires really another talk, but we are derived from small groups of hunter-gatherers and we are tribal, we are overly optimistic, and we are blind to information outside our normal range. Daniel Kaderman speaks of what you see is all there is. We have a remarkably poor appreciation of statistical risk. And we are resistant to thinking deeply about things. We are hardwired to discount our future. So it's remarkably easy for populists to mislead us and it's very difficult to think globally and project the challenge into the future. The uncomfortable truth is that on the time scale we have, the only potential solution is to massively cut emissions from our lifestyles in the next 10 years. And that is a challenge for each and one of us in the audience here and people that are listening to think of how you can seek to cut your emissions yourself and to act locally. There is one other point I'd like to make very briefly. And that is that we are be talking about emissions all the time, but I would contend that the energy itself is a central issue that we have to talk about in the end. These are a series of quotes from important and influential people over the last hundred years. Everything that we do is a transaction of energy. Everything that we achieve is a transaction of energy. We talk in terms of emissions, but we don't talk about the energy that's behind this. I claim in my book, which <laughs> you may wish to buy, on the way out, but you may not, um, uh, is that the more energy you use, the more power you have. And it is a characteristic of humans and of biological systems to acquire more and more power. I think we also see this in Ukraine and in Russia at the moment. As we accumulate more power, we create more complexity and we use more natural resources. So the idea is, the idea that nuclear fusion will suddenly solve our problems or nuclear fission will in 20 or 30 years will solve our problems and that we'll have plenty of energy, I don't think actually admits to the serious issue of human dependence on energy. So I, I'm, I'm, I will not pursue that more because the time is running out. I would just like to, to summarize. My message to you today is really quite so straightforward. In the age of spin, look at the numbers, look at the data. And the data tells us we have 10 years to react. The data also to me tells us, although we have to get renewable resources and do all sorts of things in that time frame. The only viable solution, if, if solution is the right word, is to cut our use of energy drastically. The Welsh Government could do one simple thing, decrease speed limits on roads. That would cut our energy demand and give a message to people that in fact cutting energy is actually vital. Technologies are important, but they will come in later. The other central message is that global warming challenges us as individuals. It's the very basis of our lives, our dependence entirely on energy sources. I haven't had a chance to go into it 
uh, that it, it's a, a long, long issue. It's an ethical issue, it's a political issue, it's an economic issue, and it's an environmental issue. It's taken very often as a technical fix. I don't think technical fixes will fix it at all. And the other point is that the Russian invasion has been a laser beam onto this. It's focused on our addition to cheap fossil fuels. That's behind what Putin was uh, hoping to achieve. It's shown the amazing power and wealth of small, usually corrupt elites. Equally apparent has been that our educational, financial, and legal system is designed to protect these corrupt elites. That's what's going on now in the city of London, rich large. It gives power to some of the most unsavory characters in the world uh, because they control our energy supply. And also it powers what it appears to me to be imperial pretensions, which are extraordinarily dangerous. On the other hand, we've also seen the immense bravery of the people of Ukraine. But they are looking for freedom. I hope they are not making the mistake of thinking that freedom is just the right to get more stuff and more growth. But freedom is a more subtle concept. We tend to equate growth with progress and prosperity. Economic growth, I think, is a mirage in that sense. Hope. I was told I had to finish on a note of hope. I'm sorry to have been so depressing. Um, <clears throat> is there hope? Yes, there is hope. And I, I curiously find hope in the fact that climate change is really pressing on us because hopefully the world will have to react in the next few years and reconsider the model which has successfully given us wealth, but is within itself containing the capacity to undermine us all as civilization. So, yes, there is hope, but there's also hope in another sense. We're lucky around here. There are a, a range of wonderful local initiatives. I've just mentioned one, Ali Ogwen, uh, where people are trying to help themselves and to generate their own energy and to generate their own energy, not just in a physical sense, but also in a social sense. Um, I have a list of them here, but time won't permit me to go into them. We need to marry that with a European grid. If you think of electrical grids, when we have a lot of renewable energy sources, they are variable, they are intermittent. But if we have a European grid of that energy, then it stabilizes. It becomes much more stable. So it's the old thing, you know, think globally, act locally. It's been said since the Rio summit in 1992, it's still true and we're still failing, but we need not. We still could do much more. And thank you for your attention. And I can, can I ask you all to thank Jonathan normal way for his fascinating and, and, and very, uh, 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 challenging lecture tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, well